And I want to say it succinctly. Don't let the familiarity with the song, don't lose the lyric. These songs this morning, especially as we were going through them, they're so rich in their lyric and they emphasize and back up scripture. So sometimes when you know something really well, it's just really easy to kind of go through it super rote and we're just gonna, but don't, don't lose the lyrics and let's continue our worship with song.
that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of seeming loss. The Father turns his face.
sense in which we're surprised that you allow us to be standing in your presence but then there's another sense that says Christ has been crucified and has risen he has risen and therefore we have entrance into your throne room not only to to be there but to stand before you and worship you and give our requests Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the the wonderful gift to be able to worship you. Thank you for who you are. You are truly the ancient of days who deserves all honor and glory. We thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, we celebrate your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As the kids are going in the back, the, uh, those that are going to be taking the Biblical Foundations class, um, you'll be meeting downstairs at the end of the hallway, the, oh, careful now, all right, um, the fellowship hall is going to be taken up because they're getting that ready for potluck a little bit later. So if you're with the Biblical Foundations class, you'll be meeting at the end of the hallway and just follow Stan. All right, so can we let the kids know that we love them on the count of three? One, two, three. We love, we love you. you. All right. If you would, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. And again, if you have have your notes, uh, you can go ahead and um, definitely look through them and you're going to need that yellow sheet of paper that's in your bulletin pack as well. A little bit later. During uh, the week... There was a uh, political figure that decided that he was no longer going to be uh, one party or the other. Y'all thought I was going to go in a different direction, didn't you? I am not. Um, but he, this this gentleman decided he's not going to be a part of a biblical or a biblical or a, a political party one way or the other. He's going to be an independent. And he wanted to do so, and the reason why is I think it's, it's laudable, it's, it's a good thing. He wanted to make sure that, um, he wanted to bridge the gap, get relationship with people on both sides of the aisle. And I thought, that's, that's good, that's great. <clears throat> but all of Washington most of Washington, most of America, most of the world is missing the point. And the point is, we need Jesus Christ. We need to be born again. You can drop all the policy you want. 
change all the different political parties that you want, but until you're born again, it's going to be a mess. We do as best as we can in a family. We do as best as we can in a political party. We do as best as we can in a local business. In a big box business, we do the best that we can and have wonderful, wonderful ways of handling leadership and all the rest. All that is good. But until a person becomes born again, that is, they have seen God for who he is and asked him for forgiveness through Christ and Christ alone, received his grace. Again, all the policies that you want to make in your family, in your personal life, while they may be good, is it pleasing to God? You can have all your, in other words, you can have all your ducks in a row, but if your ducks are flying south and God says they need to be going north, you're still not on board with his plan. I guarantee you, no country, no family, no one person is going to be where they need to be unless a person is born again. Unless they experience freedom through the gospel. And it is the church's responsibility. Here's God's plan. Church's responsibility to give the gospel. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Now, as a disciple, this is evangelism is part of what we do. We give the gospel. And it's very understandable why we would feel intimidated to share the gospel of Christ. I'll give you just a few reasons why it's understandable that we would be a little bit intimidated. Um, Sherry and I are in the middle of watching a cult documentary, a documentary about another cult, and there are thousands of cults worldwide right now as we speak. At least hundreds in America. Some of y'all probably didn't know that. And one of the reasons that people may have hesitation to investigate Christ is because of false religions and cults and they might figure, well, when somebody comes to me with Christianity, biblical Christianity, the biblical Christ, they're gonna have their guard up already. Why? I don't wanna be another cult member. That's the mindset some, with some people, not all people. I don't wanna go into another religion. I don't want to do that. It's, and it is understandable. So the Christian is there with the mandate from God to say, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel or proclaim the gospel. And they know what's facing them. They have that against them. Also, Christians know that people who are not Christians, they're blind to Christ. They're blind to the gospel. In other words, you ever been talking to somebody about whatever it is you think is important. And after you go through about 15 to 20 seconds, if you're not done within 45 seconds, you watch. Do their eyes glaze over? Oh, come on. I know as a matter of fact, I've been talking to people long enough. I, I kind of do that for a living. I talk to people <laughs> in some way or another. And you can see people's eyes glaze over. And to you, it's important, but to them, and one of the reasons why people's eyes glaze over when we're telling them the gospel is they're blinded to Christ. The, the Bible says that. Uh, another reason mankind is spiritually opposed to Jesus. And on and on and on and on and on. So we as Christians have the call by Christ to go give the gospel so that they can have freedom, eternal freedom and eternal life. But it's difficult for us because we know what we're going to be facing. And we don't want to handle, it's, it's difficult for us to handle rejection anyway. So we have all of this. And yet, disciples 
of Jesus Christ still evangelize. We still give the gospel. So today, what I'm hoping is to give you a little bit of theological background, a little bit of a biblical background, and give us some practical tips on how do we share with our friend, with our neighbor. Lord, what I say is not going to matter too much, but what is it that you're going to say? Speak to us through your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. So we got to count on God to do his sovereign work. He tells us to go, we go. He tells us to proclaim, we proclaim. He does his work all in the midst of that. Adrian Rogers, and I've, I, before he went to heaven, I got to hear him speak many times. He was called the Prince of Preachers for the 20th century. He was amazing. He said, there is no greater joy than bringing a soul to Jesus Christ. When you're sitting right across the table from somebody and you're telling them the gospel and they end up saying, Christ, forgive me, right in front of you, they're bar none. It's amazing. Hear now the word of the living God. Mark 1, 16 through 20. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the, the brother of Simon, casting a net in, in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. It's the word of God for the people of God and all of creation. And that's gonna be our jumping point right there of what a disciple is like. Last week we went into a lot of different aspects of what a disciple is, what a disciple should expect. But let me, let me throw some things out before we get to the practical part of it. First off, Christ is worth following in all things, including in evangelism. We have this thing, whatever it is in your life that you have a difficult thing with, we have this thing where God cannot possibly overcome that in my life. False, he can, he will. And when it comes to evangelism, many Christians have a way of thinking in their mind, oh, I can't do that. The Bible says, not only does God command you, but the Bible says, yes. Through his power, we can tell people about Christ. So a few reminders of the word follow, just a reminder of last week. I know a lot of you were not here last week, so just a few reminders. And Mark... 1, 16 through 20, you see that word follow in there? When it says follow, here's what we surmised from it. Jesus commands these, these men to be his disciples and they came after Jesus. So the desire was there. They wanted to. Next, in obeying Jesus' call, they joined or they sided with his party and became his disciples. So come on over, follow me. And they're like, yes, I'm going to do that. So they actually physically go and then they said, I'm going to be on his team. That's basically the way to look at that. And throughout this whole thing, they had the mindset to say, I'm dropping everything and I'm going to follow Jesus. And that's what we're called to do as, as Christian disciples. Next off, fishermen, this is a pretty obvious statement, Fishermen are fishers of non-Christians. When you see the word fisherman in the Bible, in the New Testament, what Jesus is talking about is that you and I, as Christians, we're going to go fishing for men. How many of you, I'm sure a lot of you go fishing, you like to fish. I'm looking at one person right now that likes to fish. Hello. People, there are a lot of people that like to fish. I don't 
particularly enjoy it, probably because I came from the South, and when you go fishing in the South, you sit in the sun all day long, and it's, oh, good night, 90-something degrees. But here, Jesus says, go ahead and be fishers of men. And when he's talking about men, he's talking about people, the sea of humanity, those that are not Christians. This is the who of evangelism, if you wanted to say it like that. And you might ask, why me? Why do I need to go and tell the gospel? Because of what the words become and fishers mean. He said, listen to this. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. That word become, please listen carefully. That word become, this is gonna real, I hope this will encourage you. You're a little bit afraid to go out and give the gospel. Here comes this word become. That's genomai in the Greek. And it means to become. Like you're transforming into that kind of a person, to be made into that person. And in that process, you're becoming one of mind with God. So Christ is telling you, go do this. And you're a little bit hesitant. You're a little bit unsure. But the more that you spend time in his word, the more that you pray to him, what happens? The Lord is renewing your mind. You didn't, when you become a Christian, you don't check your mind at the door. Christ is all about logic. He's also about emotion. But he is in the business of changing our character. We used to do this. Now we're going to do that. And he promises to do so. Because why? You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So you're a little bit afraid to go ahead and talk to people about Christ. Don't worry. Jesus will change your heart and give you the desire and want to. And then Fisher's it means salt and sea. And Jesus is literally saying, go out to these people who are in the sea of humanity. Go out to them. And while you're going out to them, I'm going to make you become a fisher of people who don't know me. That's what he does. The worst thing you could do is say, I am way too scared to go out and do that. What we want to do is say, Lord, like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Don't worry about being scared. Don't worry about that. He will change you. So we're to go out in the sea of humanity and fish for people. Next off is that we give the gospel for people's freedom. We give the gospel for people's freedom. This is the why. In John 8, 31 through 32, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. That's an obvious statement. And you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. That's exactly right. And it'll set you free in all kinds of manners or all kinds of different things. But mainly, you'll be set free to be a child of God, have eternal life. So here's the thing. Jesus calls you and me as Christians. First off, he makes us born again. Then he calls us and we begin to become. And then as we're becoming, he is pushing us out of the nest, as it were, and we're going to people that we know don't know Jesus, and our goal is to have people be made to be set free, and the way that God does it, his plan is to use people, to talk to people. That's how he does it. That's his plan. And he empowers us to go out. So when we evangelize, here's what we're doing. We are literally calling non-Christians away from a life of sin, which includes their willing enslavement to idols, 
their idolatry. We're calling them away from selfishness. We're calling them away from rebellion against God. And we're calling them away from an eternity in hell. What we're calling them to when we go out and give the gospel, we're calling them to forgiveness from God. We're calling them to serve Christ and others for the sake of Christ. We're calling them to joy and peace, which includes a life filled with difficulty. Yes, it does. But with the promise that God is going to walk with you through it all. We're calling them to hope, which we talked about in men's group this morning. We're calling them to a willingness to accomplish his purpose. It's no longer your purpose. Again, we're becoming. So he's calling you to his purpose and he's calling us He's calling us Christians to go out and call people who don't know Jesus to an eternity with God in heaven, surrounded by his love for them. Forever and ever, amen. That's what we're doing. We're calling people out, but we're also calling people to. We're calling people from, we're calling people to. We're calling people from, we're calling people to. That's what we're doing. And again, God gets it. He understands that we're but dust and we get scared. But he's having us to become. Having us to become. Next, here comes the what. We proclaim the gospel. Matthew 10, 7. Might be a good idea to go ahead and turn to, to Matthew Chapter 10, verse 7. We went over Matthew chapter 10, a few of the verses last week, but now we're going to go over to the more evangelistic verses. And here's what God wants us to do. He wants us to proclaim the gospel. This is the what? Matthew 10, 7. As you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a lot like John the Baptist. When he said in Matthew 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what he's, he's calling them to get out of your life of sin. Come to Jesus. And what's the kingdom of heaven? What are we proclaiming? We're proclaiming that come to Jesus Christ. It is he himself is the good news. And that good news message that he gives us is that he forgives sin and only he can do it. Only he can do it. You cannot do it by being good or anything else. Only he can provide you with eternal life. So that's our job. So we become born again. We are called to become fishers of men. We start talking to people. He's changing us into evangelists, as it were, because everybody is called to evangelize. Every Christian. And mom and dad, one of the best ways that you can evangelize is your kids. It's one of the best ways that you can give the love of Christ is... That's your mission field, predominantly. So that's what we do. We go out and we proclaim the gospel. That's what we do. That's what we do. Now, sadly, not everybody wants to hear the gospel. Not everybody wants to hear the gospel as we skip down to Matthew 10, 14. And whoever, Jesus says this, and whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you leave that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. That's what Jesus says. This was a Jewish custom against non-believers, people that didn't believe in God. Paul and Barnabas, they did the same thing to the Jews when the Jews got mad that people were getting, they were mad at people for getting saved. In Acts 13, 42 through 52. 
And the point is, is if people aren't receptive, leave them alone. Don't, don't poke the bear, as it were. Don't mess up the hornet's nest. Real quick thing, as most of you know, I'm from Louisiana, and I had a friend who was going down the bayou one day in the swamp, and it was, it's called a little P-Row. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a little bitty boat, a little bitty tiny boat. It comes maybe, the side of it comes maybe this far off the water, and it's literally made for fishing. And they're going down through the swamp, and there are trees and everything. I don't know if anybody's ever gone through a swamp before. It's nasty in there. And you're going through the swamp, and all of a sudden, there's this giant hornet's nest that's hanging from a tree. The current is going, pushing them, so there's no way they can stop and back up. But they're going just slow enough that if they bump that hornet's nest... They're going to stay there for a little while. (laughs) So they're going, they're going and going. And the only thing that they could do, the only thing that they could do to, to help themselves is to lay down in the boat. And as they go under this big hornet's nest, they're going under and under and they're laying down and they're looking at this hornet's nest. And and they just roll right past it. Never got stung one time. That's smart. It's a good thing to do. So next time you're in a P-Row in the swamp, you know what to do if you encounter a big old hornet's nest. Here's, here's the deal. When we're talking to people about Christ, people, um, as we've already heard, they're, in one way or another, they're against God. And here's something in our community, in our culture, we are so much, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to get God's favor myself. Sir, ma'am, no, you're not. It is a free gift. You were born a sinner. You sin. Double jeopardy. You need his help alone. And if you're talking to somebody who has all of these different things that are going on in his mind and somebody is going to dare to talk to them about Jesus Christ, if they give you the signal, and I'm sure you can pick up on the signal, that they're not wanting to talk at that point, leave them alone. Because if you don't, it's like poking the hornet's nest. What would it have been like for my friend if he were like going down the bayou and he said, oh, here comes a hornet's nest. Hooray. And just claps it between his hands. What do we think is going to happen? We need to be, sometimes one of the most loving things that we can do is just say, appreciate you giving me the time that you did definitely going to be praying for this person and walk away. But that's not only the only thing about this. It, it, should, it should grieve our hearts that people don't want to hear the gospel. It should cause us to weep in one way or another. <clears throat> weep for their souls. Luke eleven thirty four. 34, oh, Jerusalem, this is Christ. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you did not want it. There are people in this society, in this town, that do not want it. We still pray for them. We still love them. Luke 19, 41 through 44. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, Jesus cried. He wept over it. And that word cried means it has a connotation of weeping loudly. It grieved his heart that his countrymen are rejecting the gospel. And he said, if you knew in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. 
For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave you leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And I guarantee it right now, there are hard hearts out there that are not recognizing the day of their visitation when someone like a faithful Christian comes to them and says, thus saith the Lord, be saved. And it's so sad and that ought to cause us to weep. So we're going to have opposition. And here's something else too. Some people, some Christians don't want to give the good news out, not because they're against the good news, but they don't want to give the good news out because they're afraid of rejection. And this is where we need, we need to go back to the gospel, go back to the cross and say, Lord, I'm making it about me again. It's not about me. It's about you and you saving that person. The Lord will give you the time to do this, to talk to people. But if that's something that's getting in the way of, your, of our responsibility of, of talking to people, let's look at it like this. God desires to save people and he desires to use you to do, to do the work that he wants to do. And our job is just, we're the male, male people. You're the mailman, you're the mail lady. We deliver the news. Now, also, giving the gospel, it brings persecution. Matthew 10, 16 through 22. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serp- serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of... of uh, these people that are unbelievers, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Those are the non-Jewish people. But when they deliver you over, do not worry about uh, what you're to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Here's some frightening news to come along. Verse 21. And brother will betray brother to death. And a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. So you can guarantee that when you give out the gospel, that there will be some form of persecution that will be given to you, whether uh, physically, mentally, or verbally. It's to be expected, but the Lord walks with you. And before we get on to our yellow sheet, I'll say this, that evangelism requires prayer. Here's as simple as I can make this. Use the entire Bible as your template. The entire Bible is filled with God doing what? Reaching out to people. Be saved. From Noah and the ark all the way to the book of Revelation and in between and before that. A good prayer to pray is God save them. (laughs) Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. If sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Spurgeon is not saying, let them all go to hell. No, he's saying this. If they are going to go to hell, our responsibility and our heart must be, don't go. 
Abandon all hope in yourself. Go to Jesus. But know this, you always have a friend in me and I am praying for you. So in, at this time right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and if everybody could take out their yellow sheet and we're gonna walk through it together. Nothing to write down. It's just guiding step by step by step by step. In evangelism, a disciple connects, invests, and communicates. And look, you can mark whatever words you want, whatever phrases you want, just try to make it as catchy as possible. But here's the deal. Christians need to proclaim the truth as lovingly as we guide people into a saving relationship with Christ. And mark it, you don't save anybody. <laughs> we don't save anybody. So take the pressure off of you. What are we? We're male men or male women. That's what we do. We deliver the mail. That's exactly what we do. That's what we do, prayerfully in the power of the Spirit. It is God's job to save, and it's their responsibility to receive the gospel. So here we go. Connect and invest. <clears throat> that side of the sheet, connect and invest. We'll get to the, uh, the uh, communicate in a bit, but connect and invest. Here's what we've got. Take the, take the direction. Be intentional about bringing Christ and his gospel to others. Just get your mindset ready to go. Say, hey, I want to see people in heaven. And I want them to be able to come up to me in heaven and say, man, thank you for sharing the good news for me. Jesus' main goal was to seek and save that which is lost. We need to follow what Jesus said. That's part of being a disciple. Seek others for God and introduce them to Jesus so he can bring them forgiveness. So here's where we start. We prayerfully ask God to bring people to your mind. And you probably don't even need to pray about it. You probably know people in your uh, area of influence that are not saved, who need the gospel, who need to be set free. You already know. Then I would suggest this, make the connection with them. Some of you probably already made the connection. Fantastic. But make the connection. Connect with who God leads you to through conversation, invites to coffee, life events, church events, all that other, whatever it may be. But ask God, help me to connect in some kind of way. Some of you fish, literally. Invite them out to fish. Some of you may macrame. I don't know. <laughs> but you've got something that you do. Invite them. Take time out. And you may say, well, my, my schedule is very busy. God understands that. We submit our schedule to him and he graciously, not, please hear me, not legalistically, but he graciously helps us to order our steps, Right? That's what the Bible promises. But make the connection with people. And then invest in the friendship. We, we serve them and we listen during the process. And we answer their questions. We follow through with them. And this, this step right here, this invest in the friendship, this may take years. But it may take months or weeks. But they need to know that you're their friend. And that even if they do reject Christ right now, you're still there for them. And this is where the ego goes away. You say, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Okay, they may turn Christ away right now. And they may, may be mad at me at a little bit, but you still bless those that, what? Curse you. And despitefully use you if they choose to do that. And we need to ask God, please help us out with this balance because at one point we don't want to poke the, the hornet's nest, but at the same time, we do want to be assertive enough to let them know um, eternity is on the line. That's the bottom line. Eternity is on the line here. 
And if somebody is in your life, like in your house, let me encourage you on this, that, that they don't know Christ. Um, one of the worst things that you could do is, is preach at them. Like you don't want to set up a lectern in your house and say, sit down, you need to hear that. <laughs> you don't want to do that, all right? You want to be gentle with them, gentle as a dove. And follow the Lord's leading. Okay, make the connection, invest in the friendship, and then impart truth for their eternity. Impart the truth, impart truth for their eternity. When the time comes. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, men are going to hell, and I'm sure he means women too, but people that are lost. Men are going to heaven or to hell, and it is time that we came to close grips with them about this all-important matter. God, help us to do so. Christian, there is a time in your life, if you're going to be faithful, that God is going to lead you to a point to where you need to get with your coworkers, you need to get with your your friends, your family, people that do not know Jesus and God will sovereignly, providentially set up a time where you're able to share with them about the gospel and asking them questions and answering their questions. So one of the things that we can do is share how you became a Christian. Now, here's how you became a Christian. God saved you. He died on the cross for your sins. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for your sins. He substituted himself for you. Took the penalty, took God's wrath, that which we could not take. And he died and then he rose again. And that if we call out to him in faith and repentance, we will be saved. And you tell them the gospel, but you tell them, what your circumstance was. Because sometimes God will pair you with people that have a similar background as you do. Everything that happens on the planet, God providentially sets up. So he's concerned about every little detail. So if you were a football player and that person was a football player, if you were a cheerleader, that person was a cheerleader. Oh, okay, you, here we you understand things in common doesn't always happen that way, but sometimes it does. When it does come time to tell them about this, tell them their need for forgiveness. We've all sinned. Romans 3.23. All those who are unforgiven, they are under God's wrath. Ladies and gentlemen, when you, if you hide the truth from them, you're doing them a disservice. The Bible itself says, flee from the wrath to come. They need to know that their sin has put them in a place where they justly deserve God's wrath and they will pay for an eternity. And why do people need to pay for an eternity in hell for sinning against God? Because God is an eternal being. We can get our account settled on the cross or in hell. But tell them their need to repent, to turn away from sin. God has good things for them. God has amazing things for them. Wonderful things. Give them the good news, the gospel, what we've just talked about. They need the gospel. But to get them into that place, God is going to use you to tell them the bad news first. And again, and again let me remind you, you Become, 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 get with God, God every day, day. Help, help him, him to, to make, make you become, become to that best disciple to where you're, where you're able, able to share. share. And then you'll be available always. So, so, so turn, turn over, over that sheet. sheet. And here's, here's the last part, part communicate. Here's the last part, part actually communicate. People, people are far from Christ, you know who God is. So that's, that's, that's the first part, part of our conversation. That may last for months or years. But they, they need, need to know, know who they've sinned against. against. Uh, they, uh, they, they need, need to know, know who, who we are. And we're, we're, we're creation of God. God, God, God cares enough to create you. And we're, we're, we're image bearers of God. 
God. But we're also sinners. We were born in sin and we do sin. And then they need to know what the punishment is for who we are and what we've done. And then part of that conversation, again, is going to be coming up to the gospel. Okay, you've heard all the bad news. Now let me tell you the good news. Here's the good news. And again, I don't know how many cups of coffee, how many Taco Bell burritos, I don't know how many bike rides, whatever it is that you do, that it will take. But understand this, Christian, we all have this responsibility and it is a glorious opportunity. It's a glorious responsibility to be able to say you can come to the King of Kings and be forgiven and spend eternity with him. Such love. Such love. And by the way, in our talking to people, you can't argue with people but you can give them a good case. Nobody has ever been argued into the kingdom of heaven, ever. They're, they're gonna need to do some business with God. They're gonna need to spend some time apart from you with God. And God is gonna work on them. And then they need to know how to properly respond to the gospel, receive forgiveness from God. And that's when they actually turn to him and cry out to God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And all those who come to Jesus, he will in no wise cast out. He receives everybody that comes to him in faith and repentance. That is an amazing thing about Christ. It's not that he he tells you the bad news and says, well, because you've done all this, you cannot come to me. No, he will take the worst of the worst. Say, come to me. I'll make you holy. I love you. I love to redeem people, to buy them back. I love doing that, he, he proclaims. And if you're needing a little bit more detail on this, I've also written in this sheet, on our website, we have the gospel. On our table, outside here, in the hallway, there's, there's a, a, a printout that says why we need Jesus and it goes through this. It's, it's like five pages, but it really explains the gospel to people. Why we need Jesus. And that's the other thing that's on that table out there are these cards that we had made up for us. Like you don't have to work here, but it is for the Christian and on there is our is the, the church's name, where we're located at, all of that, but it's got a big space on there where you can write down your name and your phone number. So as you are connecting with people, you can hand this card to people and say, look, if there's any other way that I can bless you, pray for you or whatever, hey, get in contact with me. Hey, next Tuesday, we're gonna get together. We're gonna get something to eat. We're gonna go out to lunch, whatever it may be. And here's my card with my phone number. You got my phone number. If you need something, give me a call. So Christ Community Church, we want to be able to give people the the tools and the resources with which to help people experience the freedom of Jesus. J.C. Ryle said this, if you love Christ... Never be ashamed to let others see it and know it. Speak for him, witness for him, live for him. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Help us to be faithful representatives of you and help us to be faithful to you in our culture, in our sphere of influence. Save people in our sphere of influence that need to be saved and help us Help us to be bold and loving and truthful. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's please uh, get our hearts ready for communion.